Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Trump and what his presidency means to credit unions. We'll be tackling the top nine questions on the minds of every credit union leader, and there is no one better to give us insights than our featured speaker, Jeff Pacino. I'll introduce Jeff in just a moment, but first allow me to introduce myself to you. My name is Dennis Sullivan, and I am chairman of the National Directors and CEOs Leadership Convention. And we're very proud to bring you this presentation today. As many of you know, we are getting ready to celebrate our 40th anniversary this August in Las Vegas. It is already shaping up to be our biggest and best convention to date. But as part of our commitment to bring you cutting edge solutions and practical guidance, we're breaking from tradition a bit. And we plan to bring you more guidance throughout the year with webinars, just like this one. And of course, you're invited to our full convention August 1st through the 4th at Caesars Palace, Las Vegas, where we will be sharing even more solutions and guidance, like you will hear in just a moment, from a terrific lineup of speakers. And I'm very excited to introduce one of our favorite speakers from the convention and today's featured guest, Jeff Pacino. Jeff is a two-time presidential appointee and former NCUA board member. He now serves as a lobbyist and advocate for credit unions on Capitol Hill. So there are very few people in the country who have the inside track on how credit unions may be affected by the Trump administration than Jeff Pacino. I will be your host, and I'll fire the questions to Jeff. So Jeff, if you're ready to go, let's get started with our first question. Here it is. How will Trump's pension for executive orders affect the financial industry, and in particular, credit unions? Well, Dennis, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the invite. I know we've got a tight time schedule as a guy from Illinois. And as an Italian, I speak quickly, and I notice I've got about three minutes per question, so I don't want to waste anything. Uh, frankly, the only people that anybody has to blame for kind of the pension for executive orders might be the Democrats themselves. President Obama used executive orders more than any other president had previously, and he did it kind of to get around the fact that there was a lot of legislative gridlock. I guess my answer to be how they how would they affect the financial industry and credit unions is it's probably going to be limited. Um, most of the executive orders that have been put out don't affect NCUA as an independent regulator. Um, they have agreed that they will probably abide by some of them, including the hiring freeze and one of the one slides we've got a little later. But I personally don't think that the executive order pensioned uh, is going to be much in terms of, of what credit unions are going to feel for the upcoming year or four years. Okay, good. So. What about this appointment to the third seat on the NCUA board? Any insights there? Well, as most of you, as most of your listeners know, uh, Debbie Matz's term expired in April of 2015. She stayed on a little longer and then uh, and then finally departed the board. So you have an opening on the board right now with one Democrat in Rick Metzger, one Republican in Chairman McWaters. You obviously assume that the White House, being Republican, would use this seat to name a Republican. The Fine the ointment comes up when you realize that Rick Metzger's seat expires in August of this year. And what the listeners may or may not know is the term on the seat, the clock starts running when the term expires. In other words, the, the term that Debbie had of six years, the clock is ticking. And in April of this year, we'll only have four years left on it. When you're talking to potential nominees about taking a position in D.C. or um, on a regulatory or, or an agency board, one of the questions they ask is, how long is the term? And so what I think may happen in this position, in this particular case, is the Republican administration may choose to try to get a name for the Matt seat and a name for the Metzger seat ready to go, probably by late August, and introduce them in in, in uh, I'm sorry, in late July, and introduce them in August when Metzger's term is up. What this will allow them to do is flip the terms on the seat to where they can give a Republican a six-year term and they can give a Democrat a four-year term. Now, that's the machinations of how they do it. The stuff people really care about is who it might be. Um, I've heard a few names. Um, some I think have been reported in the media, so I can feel free in using them again. Um, one of them is former. NCUA chairman and board member Mike Frizel, who was on the um, who was on the transition team, um, in, in total total honesty and total opaqueness, Mike has told me that he's not interested, um, but his name has been bandied about. Um, Peter Barrett, who's also on the transition team, his name has been bandied about. Um, however, I would 
be quick to tell folks sometimes the people that get these nominations are the ones that aren't the names that we hear. So as to who it is, it remains to be seen. I just think what your listeners would want to understand is they may wait until they can put both a Republican and a Democrat on the board at the same time come August. Just to follow up on that, Jeff, any sense of what type of person um, that the administration would like to see in that seat? Well, that's always a tough call. I mean, obviously, you'd love to have somebody who's got a little experience, or you'd love to have somebody who understands credit unions, at least from our standpoint. I think the interesting thing about this administration is since President Trump had never been an elected official before, um, you don't see that usual group of hangers-on that have been with them for years before that you would have seen if Hillary Clinton had been elected, so to speak. I mean, you had a lot of people who were Clinton supporters and have been with the Clintons for years who I guarantee you would have been clamoring for positions, um, and this might have been one to fill it. So as to the type of person, the only thing I would ever hope for is that you try to get somebody who either A, understands how to regulate, or B, understands credit unions. Okay. Yeah, had Hillary Clinton been president, I wonder who she would have selected or asked to sit on that seat. Moving on. <laughs> Will Trump protect credit union taxation exemption? Well, it's tough to say that the White House would ever protect the credit union tax, uh, tax exempt status. Um, we are fairly low on the totem pole in terms of the monies that our exemption represents to the Treasury. That's not to say that we can ever ignore it. And obviously, if you've been reading the papers or watching CNN or Fox News or Fox Business or MSNBC today, you know that Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin came out and said that they would have a tax bill ready by August. Um, now, August being the time of recess in this town, I am hoping that they will either have it ready in August to unveil in September, because if they put something on the table in July and let members go home for the August break, it will make these meetings that you're seeing now with Republican members and the Affordable Care Act frustration, it'll make those things look like a walk in the park. Um, so, I think what's going to happen, they're looking to obviously reduce the corporate tax. They say they're looking to reduce the personal tax. The danger for credit unions in any of this discussion is that once you open up the tax code, it means everything's in play. And the discussions that House Ways and Means Chairman, former Ways and Means Chairman Dave Camp from Michigan had a couple years ago when he was actually trying to, to work on tax reform, is there have to be no sacred cows. And so obviously credit unions look at our exemption and say, wait, we've got to keep that. That's, that's one that's worth keeping. Well, to be honest with you, everybody who's got a tax exemption says theirs is worth keeping. So I guess I don't think I can answer that will Trump protect credit unions tax exempt status. I am hoping that credit unions can protect their own tax exempt status. Now, your last question here is one that's actually a little more interesting when you talk about J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, B of A, and Citigroup. Historically, they have not gotten involved in the tax fight. Um, I assume they feel they are way too big to get involved in this. The only thing that may change this time around is I've heard rumblings that some of the big banks may get involved in the tax fight in exchange for the smaller and community banks laying off other things such as the CFPB and Dodd-Frank, which I know sounds a little, a little interesting in the fact that we think everybody hates the CFPB. I think the viewpoint of the big banks are we can live with some of this stuff, um, and it looks good politically, and it looks good from a PR standpoint. So if we've got to go along with this tax fight that our smaller bank brethren want, we'll do that, but we want to get something in exchange for it. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number four here. How will Trump's new one in two out executive order affect credit unions? So, of course, the order calls for two regulations to be removed for every one regulation that's added. So, any sense that some of the most likely regulations to be removed? To be removed? Well, this is, again, one of those, um, this is that executive order that I was talking about earlier that doesn't apply to NCUA. As an independent agency, the one in, two out order doesn't impact them or they don't have to really abide by it. Now, uh, they have said that they, the agency has, uh, I think, thus far said that they would be willing to do so. Um, but when it comes to NCUA, when it comes to actually any of these, any of these uh, regulatory agencies, 
what I think a lot of people forget is most of the time you're not passing a new regulation. You're amending a current rule or regulation. And typical Washington bureaucratic action would be to claim we're not passing a new regulation, we're amending a previous regulation, which therefore would not technically qualify under this one in, two out executive order. What I think you're going to find in most of the cases is that rather than you know worry about passing one and taking two out, a lot of these agencies in the spirit of this administration may choose just to cut regulations um, on their own. But in and of itself, this this executive order doesn't impact credit unions. What is interesting about this is that from a credit union standpoint, obviously NCUA over the last couple of years has done a lot of things in terms of risk-based capital, things like that, that were not always the most popular in credit union land. Um, frankly, what's happened is there's not a whole lot of new things for NCUA to do right now. Um, instead, what you may find are things like supplemental capital, um, you know, field of membership, member business lending. Frankly, new rules or regulations that, number one, are in some cases amendments of other rules, but more importantly, are frankly favorable for the industry. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of times people look at regulation and say, we want less. Well, sometimes having more of it helps. And in those cases, as I said, with field of membership and with member business lending, it clarifies previously written rules that credit unions, frankly, would find more favorable. Any regulations that you see that either could be removed or added with uh, the new administration? Well, uh, I mentioned risk-based capital a couple minutes ago, and I don't think there's any love lost um, on the Republican side for risk-based capital. Um, if you remember, there were uh, calls from a, more than a few members of Congress that the agency did not have the statutory ability to come up with two tiers. So I would not be surprised if that's one of the regulations that is looked at when the Republicans finally have a 2-1 voting margin on the board. Um, you know, frankly, again, much of the stuff that was done under Chairman Matz, um, I like to talk about being a little like the castor oil. And, and they took on some of the more challenging and, and tougher issues. And so right now, what you're finding is the board you know, can, can concentrate on some of those issues that are much more, um, much more credit union friendly and that credit unions are going to find uh, appealing rather than distasteful. Well, that's some good news. All right, question number five here. What new regulations are likely to come down from NCUA, kind of following up what we were just talking about? Anything more to add there? Well, again, I think you know they're, they're looking at supplemental capital, which has been you know a big issue, frankly, a big issue for the state chartered credit unions um, for a long time. It's it's obviously got some some work to be done on it, and you know, frankly, much like much like a lot of issues that tend to come out of any agency, it sometimes becomes a bit of a tug of war between the board and the staff. Sometimes the, the board, you know, wants the staff to extend a little further than the staff feels comfortable. Um, and statute and, and uh, uh, supplemental capital probably falls within that category. You know, I think the board might be pushing a little harder for a uh, uh, kind of a more favorable definition. And it's going to be those things that are coming down over the next year, two years, three years, that are probably going to be the most interesting for credit unions. Okay. Question six here. How will Trump big number on Dodd-Frank affect banking in general and credit union and our members? Uh, again, uh, Donald Trump promised that he's going to do a big number on Dodd-Frank. What's your take on that and how it's going to affect the uh, industry and our members? Well, I think if, if you're a Republican office holder over the last four to six years, you've had two issues, Dodd-Frank being one of them, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare being the other, that have been a rallying cry for the 
Republican base. And, uh, you know, obviously Dodd-Frank, which was passed in response to, you know, the last major financial crisis we had, has got a, a big target on its back. And yes, the president did say uh, three weeks ago he's going to do a big number on Dodd-Frank. The thing is that we all have to remember about this is the president can propose pretty much anything he, he would like. It's still got to get through Congress. I mean, we spoke a little earlier about executive orders, which are kind of one way around the system, but really do not hold the same weight as law. And if Congress is going to do the big number on Dodd-Frank, you're going to need some cooperation. Um, obviously, some of the Democrats uh, on the Senate side, namely House Financial or House Banking Committee ranking member Sherrod Brown from Ohio and Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts, would have a lot to say about impacting on Dodd-Frank. Um, if they do tinker with it. I think you might see some tinkering at the edges. Um, but frankly, I don't see them being able to repeal large sections of it. And the other thing is that there's there's some of the rules that have yet to even be written. Um, one of the ways that Trump could claim to do a big number on Dodd-Frank is if they just kind of put on hold writing any new Dodd-Frank rules that were part of the original bill. Good. Uh, number seven, moving right along. Should credit unions expect looser underwriting standards under Trump's deregulatory agenda? <laughs> um, Donald Trump campaigned on, on a lot of things. Um, part of him, part of it was kind of a um, an anger at the status quo and anger at the establishment. Um, I don't know if we expect looser underwriting standards necessarily under Trump. I think we've already kind of seen them loosening. Um, I tend to watch a lot of sports on TV, and I see these ads for Rocket Mortgage, and I don't, I don't, can't claim that I know everything about Rocket Mortgage, but in just watching the ad as a consumer, it brings up a lot of the same things that we saw happening back in 2000. 2005, 2006, leading up to the crisis in 2007. Um, one of the things as regulators that I've, I've always kind of marveled at is how we, we get it kind of bath backwards, to put it loosely. Um, and that by that I mean that when things are going well, regulators and regulatory agencies tend to approve a lot of things, kind of keep up with the flow. And when things start to turn south, they tend to squeeze hard. And it's always been funny to me because at the precise moment when an industry could probably use a little more care and hand-holding, regulators tend to clamp down, saying, we're not going to do this. And, and I think part of that is, is just an instinctual thing where they don't want anything bad to happen on their watch. Um, when I was on the Federal Housing Finance Board, there was a new business activity that was being requested by one of the federal home loan banks, and I thought it was a pretty good idea. So I called our head of supervision into my office, and I said, what's the holdup with this? And he gave me actually the most, probably the most insightful answer I've ever had from a staff person. And he said, Director Bacino, you got to understand that around here, nobody gets ahead by saying yes. And it hit me that he's absolutely right. If an examiner said yes to this, new business activity and the thing went well, frankly, the, the bank itself as well as our board would probably get most of the credit. But if it went south and cost the bank money, first question would be, who approved this? And we'd go look at that examiner and blame him or her. And so, you know, as I said, I don't know if the standards are getting looser because of a deregulatory agenda. I think they're getting looser because we're getting more comfortable and things are kind of reverting back to the way they were. Um, obviously, I don't think anybody wants to go back to the days of, of you know, liar loans and, and teaser rates and things like that, that, you know, interest-only loans. But the fact of the matter is that there is a segment of the financial services community that needs um, a little extra care and attention. And sometimes that can only be done by 
underwriting standards that may not be as set in stone as they have been in the past. Jeff, do you get the sense that staff at NCUA examiners also feel like those standards may be loosening? Well, that's, that's where I sometimes don't get it. Um, I have a, a handful of clients who sometimes have issues with their examiner or with their region. And, you know, sometimes the message doesn't flow from the top down as quickly as board members would like. Um, I do think, you know, I do think examiners sometimes tend to err on the side of caution. Um, I always talk to my clients about, you know, look, working with your examiner, your supervisor examiner, worst comes to worst, your regional director, to try and have your opinion known and to let them understand why you're doing what you do. Um, when I was on when I was on the board, one of the questions I always got was, you know, how many ways are there to run a credit union? And I said, to me, the answer is always there's as many credit unions as there are, that's how many ways there are to run it. And I think you have to be careful about regulating to the lowest common denominator or regulating to a set standard without understanding that things are going to be different in a lot of cases. And, and frankly, sometimes we would like the examiner and the region, as well as the NCUA itself as a group, to understand it doesn't always have to be A, B, and C. Sometimes it could be D, E, or F. Great point. Question number eight. What will happen to the controversial <laughs> Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Well, now you say controversial Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You know, I'm sure some of the folks that like it won't say this. Although I got to tell you, I don't know where those people are because I usually don't run into them. Um, this agency has, frankly, become probably uh, more disliked than any other regulatory agency in the history. Um, obviously, passed for what the supporters felt was a good cause. And I don't think there's anybody who ever wants consumers taken advantage of. The issue is in how that how that message is displayed and how it is carried out, how that mission is carried out. And the court case that called into question the structure of the agency did not call into question the decisions of the agency, which a lot of people don't understand, but it did call into question the, the, the structure of the agency and the fact that the director in the court's view, had almost more power than the president in some cases. Um, I think that the administration probably has three courses, possible courses of action when dealing with the CFPB and its director, Richard Cordry. The first, obviously, would be to fire Cordry. Now, there's plenty of court cases and in history where an administration has gotten rid of somebody, that person has gone to court, the court has decided that the firing was in error, and in most of the cases what they decide is they give back pay, but they don't give the job back. I think this would be a mistake for the administration because I think it makes a martyr of Cordry and the agency. The second option would be to just wait him out. His term expires in 2018. There are rumors that he might be thinking of running for governor back in his home state of Ohio. At some point he's going to have to declare, and he'll probably have to leave the job, or you just wait till 2018. The third case, and the one that I probably would recommend would be you currently have a Republican Congress that has no love lost for the CFPB. You have a Republican White House with no love lost for the CFPB. Why not pass that bill that they've talked about expanding the size of the board? You could expand the size of the board to five. You could give the Republicans three of the nominees. You give the Democrats two. The Democrats could choose to leave Cordry there. However, he'd be outvoted and outranked by the three Republicans that the White House would name. So that'd be their best way of being able to kind of water down and neuter the agency. And then obviously the next question would be take the funding away from the Fed and put it through the appropriations process the way the other agencies work. Good. Thank you. All right, last question here. Will credit unions be better off or worse off with Trump in the White House? What's your take? Uh, I think um, anytime you get a, a White House that is concerned about deregulation or about less regulation, and deregulation is probably not the right term, but less regulation. I think credit unions probably have to applaud that. Um, one of the questions that you asked me before and I've been asked, asked by other folks is, you know, how do credit unions view this administration? Are they worried? Are they scared? Are they, you know, are they happy? Um, I think it's probably a combination of there's a little concern. Um, there's 
probably some happiness in the fact that they're saying the right things. And then I think there's also a wait and see approach that just about everybody in the country is taking right now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, President Trump had never been elected to any office before. And so there's really no track record with him to see how he operates when issues come up. Um, so right now, it's, it's kind of everybody taking a wait and see approach to how things are going to work out. Um, but I think going back to one of your earlier questions, I think the biggest, the biggest issue for credit unions is how that NCUA, NCUA board is structured. You know, how that's the biggest impact that a White House can have on credit unions directly. I mean, if you keep in mind that there's very few issues that the White House would call for that have any impact on credit unions. Um, and and you, you basically look and you say, okay, wh what could a White House do to help or hurt? Well, the way they do that is in the type of people that they appoint to the regulatory boards that oversee the industry, and that's for us right now NCUA. So I think um, if we come back and have this discussion in four years, or in three and a half as we're entering the, the presidential race of 2020, um, and I know that some of your audience probably just held their hearts because we just finished one. Um, I have a funny feeling you say credit unions are probably better off um, because I think the economy will, I think the economy will improve, and and frankly, I think you continue to get qualified board members at NCUA who understand, as I said, how to regulate or they understand the industry. Great. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it, we had nine questions here uh, that I put out to you, and uh, just wanted to open it to you as far as final thoughts. Anything on here that you think uh, we should be addressing or you wanted to address that I had not asked? Well, I mean, obviously the first thing I always tell people is, you know, I, I'm a political animal, and, uh, you know, not everybody is as politically active or involved, but I urge people to be politically active and involved. And it doesn't mean you have to you have to go to rallies or you have to do that, but I think you have to stay kind of in contact with in contact with what the issues are, who the players are. Um, you know, I mean, the, the CUNA Governmental Affairs Conference is in town this week, and in the fall, NAFQ has their your congressional caucus. Um, you know, both are both are chances for credit unions to make sure that they stay active in the process. One of the most disappointing things that I've heard over the last handful of years was when I was in a Senate office and the, we finished with a um, uh, we finished with a meeting and the meeting went well and the senator seemed to understand all the points. And as we were walking out, he said, "Well, okay, that's great. Let me go check with my community banks back home." And it just struck me that I don't think there's ever been a case where I've heard them tell a community banker, let me check with my credits back home. And so what it, what it kind of revealed to me is just the fact that we need to keep, keep up or keep on keeping on would be the best way I could put it. Um, continue to kind of spread the gospel, to continue to spread the message. But to do that, you've got to know, you know who the decision makers are, who can have an impact on the industry. Uh, and make sure you always stay in front of them, even if you're not asking for anything. I mean, there are times where you, you, you don't have an ask in lobbyist terms when you go in. You just want them to understand, we're here. Um, I tell the story all the time about, you know, when you, when you move into a new house, one of the things they used to say in, in the volunteer fireman days is find out where the firehouse is. Because when your house is on fire, that's not the time to go looking. And I use that analogy because I tell people, look, make sure you know who your members of Congress are. Make sure you know who the key players are so that if you do need something, that's not the first time they know you. Great point. Thank you, Jeff. I want to uh, really thank you for taking the time. I know this is really a busy time for you, uh, especially this week, and appreciate you taking the time to share some of your insights. Uh, folks, you can see why I invited Jeff to share some of his insights with you. Uh, these are some tough questions that people are asking all the time, and I think we got a few more answers that we're uh, looking for. Um, if you would like to address some of your questions to Jeff, he's glad to take your emails. He's at Jeff, and notice the spelling there, G-E-O-F-F, -F, at BacinoAssociates.com. I will also be following up with an email with that information for you as well. This conference has been recorded. We will also be sending out a recording. And you can see it's sponsored by our director's convention. 
uh, Directors and CEO Leadership Convention. I'm the host, I'm the chairman, uh, Dennis Sullivan, and this is part of our celebration for our 40 years. Throughout the year, we're going to be delivering more practical guidance and solutions uh, for you, not just uh, four days in the summertime to deliver some of these uh, terrific insights, but throughout the year. So stay tuned for more hot topics as we get set to celebrate our 40th anniversary. And of course, I invite you to come to Vegas uh, for the 40th Directors and CEO Leadership Convention, August 1st through the 4th. And I'll have some more information for you as well. You can be rest assured. Uh, but you can always go to cudirectors.com for more. Jeff, thank you again for taking the time. Uh, terrific work. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis.